So as kids are leaving, it is my distinct honor to just come up here and kind of set the stage of where, we, where we've been, um, where we're going. My name is Beth. Uh, and uh, we have been going through the book of Hebrews in a series called Jesus is Better. Last week, Neil actually came and spoke on something not in Hebrews. He just threw it out the window and was like, you know what, I've got another word. And I love that. I love that our uh, speaking pastors are flexible and like open to what the Spirit is doing. And so he spoke on Jesus' love. And you kind of would think like, I don't know, I don't know. It, like me, you might be like, ah, oh, love. So soft and squishy and cuddly. And point number two was love is restorative confrontation. So it was a fiery message, guys. And I really encourage you to like listen to it and get after the heart of God. But today we are continuing our series in Hebrews. Tony is Woodall is coming up and he's going to be talking about a better heart. So I'll give it over to him. Um, well, as I said earlier, um, my name is Tony, one of the preachers here. Welcome to the Edge Church. We really want you to feel welcome. Um, we're just a big family, amen? We're just a big family. We got lots of kids. We got lots of things going on. If you got to get up, if you got to move around, if you got to attend to something else, it's not a big deal. We're just here as a family sharing in the Word of God. Uh, continue, as, uh, as Beth said, I'm going to continue in the book of Hebrews. Uh, we've been going through the book of Hebrews. Our series is called Jesus is Better. Amen. He just is. He's always the answer. At the end of my message, you'll be maybe pleasantly surprised or a little bit disappointed that the answer is Jesus. The answer is always Jesus. You can't get it wrong here at the edge. And so with that, I'm going to get into uh, my message. I'm talking about the heart this morning. Yeah. My message is called The Better Heart. So I'm going to go ahead and read the word. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 8. I specifically am reading a portion that's out of the prophet Jeremiah, and that starts in verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no need to look for a second. For he, being God, finds fault with them, being the people, when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant, and so I did for them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds. That word minds is inward, inward parts. And I will write them on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. And speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Let's pray. Lord, I love when you say you're going to do something because we can't do it. Lord, somehow, some way, you call upon people to talk about your work in people. And somehow, some way, you use that to do what only you can do. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this awesome celebratory morning. We thank you for the kids that have been dedicated, Lord. And even as we dedicate them, and even as we, in faith, stand up on stage and say that we're going to be there for them, and we're going to cherish them and raise them up in the Lord, we know that ultimately, you're the one that touches their heart. So Lord, we pray for the hearts of the kids dedicated today. We pray, Lord, that what we've done in the natural through faith, you supernaturally do in the works of those little hearts today. And Lord, we pray for every heart here, Lord. The heart is your secret place. The heart is your domain. The heart is your exclusive real estate. Lord, we pray that you do what you say you do. And we agree with what you want to do. You speak to the heart and you write your will on our heart in a way that enables us to love you and to follow you. So, Lord, we thank you for that sovereign, grace-based work, and we just come to you believing that you want to move as you say you do move. And, Lord, we just trust you with this word. 
and the rest of this morning in Jesus' awesome name. Amen. I remember, uh, this was some years ago, I was invited to preach at a church called Naperville Christian Church. Any NCCers in here? Can you get woo-woo? Woo, that's right. They are a formidable crew. They are, you can tell. They're ready for war. I brought up their name and we're going to see what I say. No, but I was uh, asked to come and preach um, at the church. Uh, their pastor at the time, Neil Shorey, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Neil was... Um, he was tied up in uh, something legally. I can't say anything else about that, but he was good. He was not the one in trouble, and so I'll just leave it at that. But he was tied up in something. I just realized I can't really say much about... Anyway, Neil's good. He's right there. He's fine. <laughs> but he was tied up uh, as, <laughs> as a part of something. Anyway, so moving on, but he's right there. He didn't go to jail. He's fine. So anyway, so <laughs> just trust me. He's a good guy. But yeah. That's right. But he needed some help in that time, and so I would go, and Steve would go, and other people would go and preach, and, and they invited me to preach, and we were going through the Beatitudes, and I was going to preach on the Beatitude that says, Blessed are they who are pure in heart, for they will see God. And now, ironically, I used to drive right by Naperville Christian Church. It's on 75th. I used to drive right by it uh, on the way to work every day, and so you couldn't get away from the fact that you were going to preach there soon. And so I was driving down the street, and I drove by it one morning on the way to work, and I said, Lord, why do you care about the heart so much? You know, I just was kind of asking very nonchalantly. I wasn't like in super prayer mode. You know, some people in their cars are like, Lord, speak. I was just like, why do you care so much? And then I was thinking about what I was going to eat for breakfast, and he spoke. He spoke to me. And he said, Lord, he said, uh, Tony, not Lord. He said, Tony, <laughs> Lord was speaking to me. Let's, let, let's, let's just recover everything here. Neil's fine. He's okay. And I'm not God. Okay, so moving on. <laughs> Woo. And he said to me, he said, Tony, I'm obsessed about the heart because it's the place where I alone dwell. Proverbs 25.3 states that as high as the heights of are for the heavens and as deep as are the oceans, so also the heart of a king is unsearchable. But not to the Lord. In Jeremiah 17, 10, we read that the Lord says and boasts of himself, I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind. There is a recorded prayer of Solomon, the second king of Israel, the wisest man who ever lived. It's in 1 Kings chapter 8. You can read the whole thing. But in the midst of that prayer that he prays after he is um, being made king, he says in verse 39, he just declares this about God. He says, For you and you only know the hearts of all the children of mankind. And of course, we know that when it's all said and done, each one of us will stand before the Lord and he will bring the light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart in Psalms. 44.21, it says that the Lord knows the secrets of the heart. The heart is God's exclusive real estate in each heart. Amen? God obsesses about the heart. He's not like us. He's not taken in by words. He's not taken in by actions. He's just all about the heart. We know that story when Samuel was going to anoint the next king of Israel after Saul, and he was going to anoint the next, uh, sorry, Solomon was the second king, David, I'm sorry, Solomon was the third king, David was the second king. When Samuel went to anoint David, he was looking for the future king and they brought some people before Samuel and Samuel saw someone who was tall and handsome and he was looking pretty good and Samuel said, surely this is the future king and God said to him, no, man looks at the outward appearance but the Lord looks at the heart. God's obsession about the heart is seen in the words of Jesus when quoting the prophet Isaiah to his detractors says, this people honor me with their lips but their hearts are far from me. Jesus didn't care about our works. He didn't care about them if our heart wasn't right. We read in Matthew 7 that on that day, he says the Lord, on that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did I not prophesy in your name? Did I not cast demons out in your name and do mighty works in your name? And he says, depart from me, I never knew you. God cares about the heart. God sees the heart. God is not like you and me. God doesn't care about our spiritual abilities. We read in the book of Corinthians that we can speak in tongues of angels and men. We can have prophetic powers. We can understand all mysteries and knowledge. But if we even have great faith to move mountains and we give away all we have to the poor and give up our body to be burned, we can do all of that and not have love. And of course, love comes from 
the heart. God's obsessed with the heart is what I'm saying this morning. We see this obsession very clearly in 2 Chronicles 16, 9. It says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward him. What we see here is we see a God pacing the earth. He's searching, he's searching. He's like a cosmic explorer. He's like a miner sifting through billions of hearts. And he's looking for the good ones. God is all about the heart. The heart is God's real estate. It's his secret prize, his obsession. He's looking, he's searching, he's sifting. He's looking at our hearts. Amen? So, the heart's kind of a big deal to God. I hope I made that point with the 85 scriptures I read. (laughs) Here's 100 more. Uh, What is the heart then? If God is obsessed with it, what is the heart? In summary, our heart is everything. The Bible tells us that the best word to describe our whole being, the fullness of our being, is to use the heart. Over a thousand times the word heart is used in the Bible. The heart is who we are. Our entire emotional state is governed by the heart. Proverbs 15 says, A happy heart makes the face cheerful, but heartache crushes the spirit. Proverbs 17 says a cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. I can go on and on, scripture after scripture. The heart is the seat of all of our joy, of all our rejoicing, of our trust, of our doubt, of our fear, of our pride. And when Jesus told us to have courage, he said that we have to take heart. John 16. The Lord wants to do something in our hearts. If our emotions are troubled this morning, the Lord wants to do something in our heart. All of our wishes and all of our desires come from the heart. We covet with the heart, Proverbs 6. We envy with the heart, Proverbs 23. And Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Wherever your heart is, there's your treasure, there's your desire, there's your wish. The heart absolutely owns the mind. According to Matthew 9, 4 and Mark 2, 8, it's our heart that does the thinking. Whenever Jesus would look into the thoughts of the people that were in front of him, it says that he looked at the heart and he read their minds. We think with our hearts, according to Psalm 77 and according to Luke 2, 9, our heart remembers, our heart reflects, and our heart meditates. This idea that our mind is somehow separate from our heart is a relatively new modern thought. It's not in the Bible. The mind is not utterly separate from the heart. It's actually impossible in God's view of us. It's impossible for us to separate our soul from our mind, from our heart. It's all one thing to him. The ancient Near East thought process, the Hebraic thought process, says that the mind and the heart are completely one in being. We tend to think of ourselves as fragmented. That's a new thought. That's not a thought in the Bible. When I say heart, That's the biggest, fullest expression of who we are. Our entire ontology, our entire being follows under that supra understanding of heart. Amen? As a matter of fact, in the Bible, it says that when our mind belies our heart and when our heart belies our mind or our soul goes against what we think, we're actually incongruent. We're in some form of evil that is not God's intention for us. Amen? From God's perspective and from the perspective of the ancient Near East mind, heart, mind, soul, all one thing. Amen? What is the heart? The heart is our moral compass, our conscience. Peter, after he preached the first message about Jesus at Pentecost, it says that the audience after his preaching was cut to the heart. Their conscience was cut open, Acts 2, 37. After David was called out by Nathan the prophet regarding Bathsheba, he prays that God would recreate for him a pure heart and replace his defiled conscience, Psalm 51. We covered that at the Mentor Tude a couple weeks ago. According to Paul's letter to the Ephesians, he says that our heart has eyes. Kind of weird. It's the best way that he could describe the fact that our heart does see and our heart does understand. According to the book of Proverbs, our heart has ears. This is why it says in the Bible over and over again that the only way that we can get spiritual truth and the truth that can change us is to get it in the heart. We have to see it with the heart and we have to hear it with the heart. Amen? 
So I threw a lot of scripture at you. Let's put it together. Let's add it up. Okay, our heart is our feelings, our thinking, our wanting, our wishing, our conscience bearing, our spiritual eyes, and our ears. What's left? The answer is our pinky toe. There's not much left after we talk about the heart, amen? Over a thousand times the heart is mentioned. This is because we can only see and hear spiritual truth with it. And that is why God is obsessed with it. Our heart is who we are, hence God's obsession, amen? Okay. Back to our text in Hebrews 8, Allah, Jeremiah 31. It says that, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. We are the new Israel, amen? Can't get into that, but we are the new Israel, amen? This is the covenant, this is the deal that God cuts with you and me, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds. I've already talked about how that's kind of just another way of saying heart. And I will write them on their hearts. When we say law here, we mean the moral law. We mean, we mean the revelation of God's character, the revelation of God's nature. That's what he's speaking into our inner being. Now, to really understand the significance of what Jeremiah is saying there and to see why that was such a revelatory thought for Jeremiah, we have to look at the life of Jeremiah a little bit, and I'll take not a long time, just a little time. Jeremiah, if you take his whole life, anybody know the nickname for Jeremiah? He was the weeping prophet. Right? Was he the weeping prophet? I think he was called the weeping prophet. I mean, I'm not like, you know, I think that anyone can get that his life wasn't all that great if he's called the crying guy. The one that cried a lot. And by the way, like talk about dangerous jobs. The most dangerous job that ever existed in the history of the world was to be an Old Testament prophet. So he like wins the award for being the toughest one and the one that cried the most. That's a lot of crying, folks, okay? So Jeremiah was the weeping prophet, but that wasn't always the case. Jeremiah's prophetic career actually started very strong and very whole. Um, we read in Second Chronicles 34 about a king named Josiah. Josiah was the king when Jeremiah started his prophetic ministry. Josiah is sometimes referred to as the last great king of Israel. Of Judah, sorry. Josiah became king. It's kind of a crazy story, but he was eight years old when he became king. Sometimes I feel like we can expect more from our kids. But anyway, <laughs> you know Josiah was eight years old when he became king. Clean up your room. You got that one's for free. <laughs> they were looking to kill him and instead they made him king. He became king at eight years old and lo and behold, he became a man after God's own heart just like his father David. And at age 25, he decided to rebuild the temple. Um, what's really cool about that is in that restoration effort, he found the book of the law. And so he found someone to read it to him and to interpret it to him and to help him understand it. And as he read it, he was struck to the heart. And he brought the people together and he had that law read for all the leaders. And because he was king, that law became the law of the land. The moral law became the civil law. It says that he went on to renew the old covenant between God and the people. It says that he went on to destroy idol worship throughout all the land. It says that he went on to do away with the exploitation of the poor and the needy and the vulnerable. And for many decades, Josiah was king and he was a good one. And that's how Jeremiah started his ministry. Unfortunately, Josiah decided to pick a fight with Egypt God didn't want him to, and he stepped outside of God's will and he got killed in battle. But Jeremiah started out strong. He had a godly king. He had the civil law on his side. He had a holy, holiness movement on his side, and all the people were being instructed in the law and the way that they should go, but it wasn't enough. The whole thing fell apart as soon as Josiah was killed. So the rest of the story of Jeremiah is a story that is not good. It's one of a city being destroyed, of a temple being destroyed, and of a people being exiled into a pagan land. 
And so Jeremiah is saying that there will come a time where God is going to write his law on the hearts of everyone is a big thing to be saying in the midst of his life because when it's all said and done, when it's all about a leader, folks, when we build our whole hope and our whole strategy for change, for social change on a leader or on the law, what happens when that leader changes out and when that law changes out? Amen? When it's all about the leader, what happens? When it's all about the law, what happens? When those leaders and those laws change. God has a different idea for social change. We read further in our text from Jeremiah 31 and found in Hebrews 8. It says, And they shall not teach each one his neighbor, and each one his brother or sister, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest. And what we see here is that this is how God wants to move in the world in the new covenant. This is a calling on us saints. God is going to do it one heart at a time. He's going to take a heart, an individual heart. He's going to speak to it, make it come alive, regeneration we call it, and he's going to make that person become a beacon of light in their own heart. It's a grassroots campaign. It's a heart-to-heart thing. Contrary, this is how the world moves. We get a leader, we give them power, we enact laws, we force it on the people. Rinse, lather, repeat. I don't know if you feel like you're doing good with your guy or your girl who's in office or if you're doing bad, but don't worry, it'll come around one way or the other, top or down. Because when we change it out, if we don't have heart change, if we don't have grassroots change in the people, it matters not. I'm just being honest. I feel like we got caught up A couple years ago in a certain election, I feel like the church took their eyes off of what God wants to do in the hearts of men and women. I think we sometimes forget where we come from and how God moves. We are not a political staple for a certain party. We are not a rallying point for the left or the right. We are the children of the new covenant. We are called to be obsessed about what God is obsessed about, the individual hearts of men and women. We need to get back to this humble thought. At the end of the day, what we do here, these gatherings and these, this extended family is what's going to change the world. Amen? Okay. We must understand that new laws, new leaders, new social programs, wealth distribution paradigms, socioeconomic enlightenments, in and of themselves are not going to fix it because none of this gets to the heart of the real issue, the dead and dark heart of humanity. And Jeremiah went from the height of heights in the history of Israel to the low of lows because he saw something that God was going to do in the future. God was going to write his own law, his own character on his people. There's something else that I have to say about the heart and I forgot to mention it before. Besides the heart being everything and the heart being the only thing, The heart is dead and dark and lost without the regenerative power of God. Amen? We read in that same prophet, Jeremiah 17, 9, we read that the human heart is deceitful above all things. We read in Proverbs twenty two fifteen that our hearts are foolish from childhood. And in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, we read that outside of God's regenerative power to restore the heart, our individual hearts, our hearts are foolish and darkened by Satan himself. And so what I'm saying is not a light thing, it's kind of a heavy thing, but I think we can take it in this morning by the grace of God that the thing that God wants to do, the thing that God said he was going to do, And the thing that he is doing today is that he is going to work in and he is going to regenerate and he is going to restore the human heart of each individual who will turn his heart toward them. Amen? I wish I had some smarter things to say. I wish I had some more interesting angles to take. But the bottom line is is that until the heart, the very center of our being, the very fullness of our being is changed to actually receive and to love the word of God and the ways of God, we will not change. We can do outward things. We can change laws. We can change leaders. We can try to get the flesh to act right, but ultimately it has to be God moving on the inside. Amen? Amen. So God said he's going to do it. Uh, One of the weird things about being in ministry 
and working in a church and, and helping a church to grow is that you realize that it's really not about you and that you really can't make what God wants to do happen, but somehow you have to get up and talk about it anyway. And so it's just a weird thing. And we were talking this morning that like, if, if like the salvation of, of humanity um, is the thing that we're going for, I wouldn't have outsourced it to the church. But God does. Somehow, some way, he uses prophets and he uses teachers and preachers and worship leaders and people serving in church and, and people gathering around um, the, their covenant family to talk and to, and to just narrate what God's doing in their lives. He uses all of it to bring about that heart change that he wants to see. And sometimes we can feel like we're the ones that are making it happen, but this morning I can tell you that no one up here thinks that we're the ones that are making it happen. Um, the word that we got this morning and the, the visual that we got this morning is that um, we were just walking before Jesus and we were just picking up the stones and picking up the big stones and the small stones and getting them out of the way. And some of us were picking up stones and getting them out of the way and others of them were rolling out this red carpet and others of us were inviting Jesus to walk his way from his kingdom to the hearts of men and women. And so you have to understand, people, and uh, all the folks who are visiting today, that church is not a place where we figured it out. Church is a place where we clean streets and roll out carpets for Jesus to get to the hearts of people. Amen? That's all we can do. And so with that, I got one more point, but I can't really preach it well because it's not going to work, and so I want to bring the worship team up. How about that? That's also something else that we do is we also take the hard part and give it to the worship team. That's okay. <laughs> you guys are happy that I'm almost over. It's like, man, that's a, that's a quick word. Yeah, woo, fast word. Boom, boom, boom. Here we go. Um, so this next, I mean, we, you know, we joke and we jest and we say that we can't make happen what God wants to do. We can, we can, we can set the road straight. We can make the, straight path, make the path straight for the Lord, right? That's what we can do. The question that we have left with is, if God is going to change our hearts, then how is he going to do it? What is going to be the vehicle? What is going to be the mechanism whereby he will take a dead heart, take a dark heart, take a heart on dim and turn it to full bright? And of course, the answer is Jesus. See, I told you. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapters 3 and 4, if you want to get into this deeper in your self-study, uh, 2 Corinthians 3 and 4, really get at how the gospel works in the hearts of men and women. Uh, I wish I had more time, but it's just, it wouldn't work anyway if I preached more, okay? So, but there's a scripture in 2 Corinthians 4, 6 that says that, for God who said, light, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The summary of the whole thing and how God gets at the hearts of men and women is that he shows them the face of Jesus. Amen? And there's something about seeing the face of Christ that radiates in such a way that it just hits in the heart spot. It hits to the very center of us and it changes us. And so the best thing we can do, the most wonderful, glorious thing that we can do every Sunday and every day of our lives is to, is to make straight the path, clear out the rocks, and make some space for God to show us his face. Amen. That's what we want to do now. Corey and I have been doing ministry together for a long time. We've been doing this for a while. We call it the one-two punch. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and... Um, Sometimes what happens is that God just aligns it in such a way that I get to get up and talk about God and the worship team gets to lead us there. So we're going to be singing a song called Beautiful Name. What a beautiful name it is. Have you heard that song before? Isn't it a wonderful song? I mean, if I wanted to take the gospel and write a song out of it, I'd write that song. So what we want to do is we want to invite Holy Spirit to make straight the path from our heart to Jesus. And we want to sing our way into the presence of God. Amen. You want to stand with me?